All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Apologies about some of the uh, technical difficulties here. Um, but uh, just a few housekeeping items to get out of the way before we get started. Um, like I said, again, thank you for joining us and appreciate participate. We appreciate your participation and welcome your feedback. If at any time during the webinar you have questions or would like further clarification on a topic, we invite you to post your questions in the Q&A window and the Mercer team will address the questions during the Q&A portion of the webinar. If we do not get to your question, we'll follow up with you after the webinar. Uh, this webinar is now being recorded and the link will be added to the My FFTC portal under resources if you'd like to access the materials again. Uh, one quick note, the my FFTC portal requires a registration to access. Again, thank you for joining us, and I will now turn it over to Greg Burris, our VP and Director of Investment Portfolio Oversight and Report. Uh, thank you, Ian. Uh, and again, welcome everyone to FFTC Second Quarter Investment Webinar. Uh, of course, we appreciate your, your attendance today and hope this meets your needs. Uh, I will now introduce Travis Pruitt and Tim Westrich. Uh, who lead our consulting relationship at Mercer. Travel, Travis will be leading the discussion, which will include a review of market conditions during the second quarter, uh, including some comments around inflation, popular topic. Uh, he'll also uh, provide remarks uh, concerning the second quarter performance of FFTC's standard investment pools. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Travis. Great. Thanks, Greg. Uh, hi, everybody, and welcome back. Uh, it's nice to be with you all again. Uh, I will uh, run through some, some materials. We have some opportunity for some Q&A and, uh, and uh, hopefully you get a good, good deal out of it. So I'm going to start uh, with a quick recap of the markets for through the second quarter, and then I'll give you some sense along the way as how we're looking since then. Uh, you can see overall really pretty solid absolute returns from the equity markets to the first uh, six months of the year. Global stocks is measured by the MSCI ACWI index or all country world index up about 12% for the first six months of the year. And that was really driven and led primarily by the US. You can see S&P 500 stocks up 15% for the first six months of the year. Uh, still pretty solid absolute returns from EFA, which are the developed markets and then the emerging markets uh, just behind the US over that period. And then you can see in the blue in the blue columns, the returns uh, for the quarter. Uh, and so across the board, both stocks and bonds generated generally positive results over that three month period. We did see yields kick up in the first quarter of the year, which still, even with a strong return for the, for the bond market, for the second quarter, we're still negative year to date, still uh, through the end of June for the broader investment grade fixed income market. Uh, but modestly so, as we might expect with uh, core fixed income. Start to boil that down in a little bit more detail. For the quarter itself, we can see that uh, growth was still good. A lot of uh, cyclical growth type uh, performance showed through. So at the top of the list for the quarter was outperforming was commodity futures. And so we have seen with a continued, uh, continued acceleration of economic growth, we've seen uh, commodity prices accelerate. And we see that in the commodity futures that were up better than 13% in the first or in the uh, second three months of the year. Uh, larger cap stocks also rotated back into leadership for the quarter. Uh, in the first quarter, it was really all about small. And that was really an extension uh, of performance coming off of the November uh, vaccine announcements. We have seen that moderate here in the last few months. Uh, where U.S. large caps have rotated back into leadership, uh, both inside and uh, inside the U.S. as well as globally. See small and mid-cap stocks still a pretty respectable return up, up about five and a half percent, and then as I noted, uh, uh, core fixed income positive uh, by about 1.8 percent. As we do, as we did see yields come down from, uh, excuse me, as we saw uh, yields come back down as uh, following that run-up in rates in the first three months of the year. And then over the last year, which is still, if you think about the last year ending June, we were still only a year ago, June, we were still only about three months off the bottom from the pandemic driven correction. Uh, so the absolute returns are still really pretty solid and, and small mid cap stocks have led most of that way as they are much more in tune with uh, a market recovery as we have seen or an economic recovery, I guess I should say, 
as we've seen since that period. So up nearly 60%, even still year over year for small mid. And natural resource stocks, again, uh, similar to the commodity futures right below that, with an increase in demand, uh, increasing aggregate demand as the world gets back to business. We have seen supply demand imbalances uh, uh, exhibit themselves. And as a result, we've seen prices go up. Uh, both for the securities as well as the underlying commodities. And I'll talk more about that in just a few minutes. I mentioned rotation uh, had changed. So larger cap stocks did outperform small by pretty wide margin in the second quarter. So we just used the uh, Russell Top uh, 200 index uh, up 12.1%. If we look at the uh, Russell 2000 growth index up 3.9%. So certainly the top 200, which are the largest 200 more growth-oriented names in the U.S. marketplace did outperform by a substantial margin in the three-month period. Uh, that actually allowed the growth half of the universe to uh, show outperformance on a year-to-date basis as well. Uh, value, though, on a year to, on an overall year-to-date basis has continued to lead, uh, although we have seen that moderate. You can see that in the green bars on this page. That has moderated some in the last quarter, uh, but value got off to a a very significant start uh, being much more economically sensitive and benefiting as the economy re reopened earnings expectations went up for those more cyclical type companies. We can really see that in the value half of the index, but uh, certainly growth did get some momentum in that uh, second quarter as demonstrated here by the, the top 200, the comparison between big cap stocks where Russell 200 growth did outperform a pretty good margin in the three month period. Uh, finally, areas that we've seen start to come back with more with more prominence in the quarter and have extended and continued that post quarter are quality and low volatility. So uh, investors have repositioned away in the shorter term, repositioned away from some of the more cyclically oriented names and the higher quality uh, or lower volatility names. And so we have seen those parts of the marketplace that that have trailed to some extent. Uh, at various points in time, we did see them come back in the quarter, and we've we've seen, continued to see that since the end of the quarter. Greg mentioned we would talk about inflation, and, and it is certainly uh, uh, front of mind for investors and consumers alike. And on this right-hand side of the chart, you can see that inflation, rolling 12-month inflation, really has spiked, the, uh, regardless of how you measure it and which tool you use to use, inflation has gone up. And, and I think realistically that should be or, or is to have been expected just given where we're coming off of. With demand low uh, coming through the initial parts of the pandemic, uh, with demand increasing significantly following, uh, certainly following the advent of the vaccines in November of last year. And as we've seen the economies, economies around the world just, just continue to open up, Consumers are out doing stuff, and they have a much higher demand for everything from cars to gasoline, uh, hotel rooms, and as a result of that, you know prices prices forever and always respond to changes in demand, and they certainly have in this period. We still currently sit in the camp that much of this inflation is transitory. Uh, that we don't think that it, it necessarily uh, demonstrates long-term systemic inflation. Uh, there are some risks to our view on that. But if I, if, we, if I take you through some of the components of the current inflation factors, you, you'll get a better sense of, of, how we, uh, of how we come to this conclusion. You can see the in the first, this is a this is a waterfall chart, but it basically gives you a sense of how we've we've built into these year-over-year -year inflation numbers. And this is as of the end of May, which is the best data we have at the time. You can see that energy uh, is a big, big portion of the basically half of the increase in inflation over uh, the last year or so. And again, I think that's that's not uncommon. We see inflation and energy prices every year coming into the summer as we come to the, the summer driving season. Uh, so some portion of this is seasonal and some portion of it is just people are are moving about more. They're getting out of their houses. They're driving more. They're flying more. And as a result, that puts additional uh, upward demand 
and therefore upward pricing pressure on energy. Uh, if Should the world stay in this pathway of recovery? Should investors and consumers continue to, to get back with their lives? We could see some additional uh, increases or, or some additional energy inflation, but at some point, we very much anticipate that we get back to the cyclical nature of energy prices uh, and that it doesn't necessarily indicate long-term inflationary uh, pressures. The, the um, I guess the risk to that is further supply dampening out of the major energy producers around the world, and they have at different points in time been successful at that. Uh, but at this point, we do anticipate getting back to more cyclical energy pricing. Similar with used cars and trucks, it's it's been very well publicized the the shortages of things like semiconductors, which you wouldn't in the old days you wouldn't think that that would impact cars, but every every car has a a bevy of semiconductors today, uh, and because of the pandemic, because of shutdowns of production for semiconductors, uh, it just put a it just slowed the supply chain. And as a result, there's not enough used car. There's not enough uh, new cars to buy. I don't know if you've driven by a new car lot recently, but certainly those by me are pretty bare. There are not a lot of car. There's not a lot of car inventory available. And again, similar to energy, if people are interested in buying, if demand uh, improves, which it has, and it you know, in addition to just reopening the economy, a lot of folks were able to save. They either weren't traveling or they weren't uh, having to commute for work. Uh, the, just their expenditures were less, so savings rates we have seen gone up. That leads to a spike in demand, and we see a spike in car prices. Again, it's the kind of thing that as the semiconductor the semiconductor shortage uh, repairs itself, which we think it will, uh, and as the world gets back to normal, we also think that this this pricing in car, in used cars and trucks, especially, we think will uh, will moderate. And, and I think you could just draw the same conclusions out. Many of these things are reasonably cyclical. The one I think in the middle, food away from home, uh, there does seem to be a, a fair push to try and push up wages uh, for folks that uh, work in those kinds of service industries. That is a potential contributor to longer term higher inflation. If, if we do see wages rise, uh, I think that remains to be seen and how prevalent that is. Uh, and where businesses, you know, seek to uh, either pass that through or or um, take that as a reduction in earnings. But inflation is something we continue to watch. But you know, based on some of the factors that I just talked about, we do think that the lion's share of these big inflation numbers are transitory. I guess I'll close my my concept on this: is is transitory is going to be a, a bit of a moving target. We'd anticipate that it will take 12 to 18 months, perhaps maybe a bit longer, to work through the system, these demand increases. Uh, and so we could see persistent inflation for a while, but but similar to the comments earlier about performance, you know, a year ago, June was, we were, we were starting to recover. It was not broad-based recovery for sure, but we think these year over year factor numbers should start to moderate if, if for no other reasons is the base it just gets higher as you move forward. The bond market also seems to be pricing in the no, a notion around these being uh, transitory. As I mentioned, yields came actually came down in the second quarter, even as inflation concerns were heating up. And as you as you may know or may be comfortable with, uh, when you invest in a bond, your only return is the coupon on that bond. And uh, if, if you invest in a bond and hold a maturity, you really only get the coupon. So if, if you get $100 in coupon from a bond, uh, and there's oh, there's high inflation. By the time you get all that money back, you can actually purchase less with it. And so bond investors, when there's a concern about inflation, they will uh, they will require higher yields to hold bonds. And we're just not seeing that yet. Granted, there's a lot of technical factors going on in the in the treasury markets and and in bond markets today, not the least of which is the Fed activity. But uh, you can't see it on here very well. But the 10-year the Treasury at the end of June was about 1.45%. And as you can see from the pink lines, that's down uh, from about 1.6%, 1.7% at the end of March. And as of today, the 10-year Treasury is at 1.18%. So again, Treasury market investors in any case, uh, and bond market, bond market investors across the, the spectrum aren't necessarily pricing in long-term significant inflation. If if there was more of a concern for that, or uh, then we believe the bond market would be pricing in or would be trading at different interest rate levels than they are today. So this is something we're watching. 
trying to get an understand, trying to maintain and grow our understanding as, as the impact of the technical factors versus the longer term fundamental factors. But rates remain low. Uh, and as a result, uh, we've also seen, uh, and we think that also is contributory to the equity returns that we have seen. So that's the markets. Uh, like I said, pretty good first quarter, or excuse me, pretty good second quarter overall. Uh, with uh, with lots of moving parts, market has started to adjust and change a little bit. Uh, fortunately, within the within the building blocks and the standard pools, uh, we've performed really pretty well. Uh, we're pretty happy with it. A little bit behind on U.S. equity for the quarter, uh, and for non-U.S. equity, which has been our um, probably one of our star performers uh, over the course of our relationship. Best performance really out of of emerging markets and. Uh, uh, on a quarter-to-date, year-to-date basis, and on a year-to-date basis, the non-U.S. equity also continues to generate a premium. Uh, global opportunities also had a really pretty nice quarter, and uh, as the more eclectic investment strategy used in, in diversified long-term growth. And then you can see at the bottom, uh, our real assets for the quarter participated really pretty nicely. Global infrastructure in the form of Lazard, uh, you can see the global real estate, which are operating companies that own and operate real estate around the world, and the global natural resources. You can see that uh, these categories at the bottom historically have had a more consistent relationship with inflation over time. Uh, and so we do have some exposure there, uh, 5 to 10% across uh, uh, many of the portfolios. And so we do have a, a more there is a stronger link in, a, in our portfolio allocations to the inflation. And we are not overweighting these positions today, but we are uh, working hard to make sure that we stay near our targets as we do think uh, as we want to make sure that we're participating in these market movements. On our risk reduction assets, uh, as, you, as you recall, we use a, a handful of tools, our hedge fund investors, it's their absolute return hedge fund strategy. We own this and diversified long-term growth in many ways in lieu of more fixed income. And so you can see up 4.2% for the quarter ahead of its benchmark and, and meaningfully ahead of, of fixed income from both the quarter and the year-to-date basis. So it's a nice combination of tools. Uh, as yields came down in the second quarter, we also benefited from some nice active management from our two active managers in the fixed income portfolio. Uh, so good premiums there, even on a year-to-day basis, uh, albeit slightly negative. And then the short end of the curve has moved around a little bit with Sterling, which runs our short duration strategy, uh, up about 20 basis points in the quarter and about 20 basis points on the year to date. So rates at the short end of the curve are still basically zero. Uh, and we can certainly see that in the money market, uh, which is the last line there. Uh, the Fed has not demonstrated a lot of interest in moving those rates, uh, although we do anticipate potentially seeing some movement later this year, uh, tapering some of the purchases that they make off their own balance sheet. And that will have some impact. Uh, they've tried that before, causes, it, it's likely to cause some noise in the marketplace. Uh, but as the, if, the, if the economy continues to stay on pace, uh, we think the Fed will have to uh, eventually address uh, these, these programs that they're running to keep liquidity high. Uh, I should have mentioned, I guess, earlier that, that with the most recent GDP growth announcement, uh, that announcement also suggested that we had returned to economic output rates that were in excess of, of that had breached pre-pandemic levels. So uh, in what's turned out to be a quite phenomenal and quite fast recovery, uh, we appear, at least from an economic perspective, to be largely on path. And as a result of that, we, we could see uh, changes in the environment uh, over the next uh, next few months. So what's that mean for the standard pools? Uh, by and large, returns have really been really pretty good, both on an absolute basis and a and a, and a pre, uh, premium to policy basis. You can see diversified long-term growth, which is our most diversified strategy, up about a little better than six percent, about 20 basis points ahead of its benchmark for the quarter. A uh, little closer premium, but still a premium in their active long-term growth, which is the uh, you know the traditional strategy with a mix of active and passive. Uh, and then income growth, which is 60% fixed income, also really made pretty nice premiums for the quarter and a nice absolute return, uh, frankly, for a 60% fixed income portfolio. And then when we look at those also on a year-to-date basis, really across the board, great uh, absolute returns in the context of a, of a market that continues to, to move forward. 
Uh, the passive option up about 8.8. 8, and so you can see what uh, uh, the passive long-term growth, active long-term growth, and diversified long-term growth all have the same uh, core long-term asset allocation strategy of about 75% to equity, 25% to risk reduction. And so you can see that there was some, there's some nice benefit in the two active strategies with those longer term figures, diversified long-term growth up nearly 10% for the first six months of the year, active long-term growth just a little bit behind that. And then again, as I noted, income and growth, really pretty quite stellar number uh, given its allocation to 60% in fixed income. So with that, I will stop and, uh, uh, and uh, take questions. All right, Travis, thank you very much for that overview. Uh, we do have a couple of questions that have come in during your comments. Uh, first one is, what percentage of the portfolio is invested in fixed income? Uh, why in light of this continued underperformance? So that's a great question. So we own fixed income. We want to build diversified portfolios uh, for, uh, for the standard pool. So we do want to own a mix of assets and a mix of different risk profiles. So we want to own different types of equities. And we need to own things that balance those equities, which would include fixed income. Uh, in the uh, varies by pool. So the diversified long-term growth pool has a target of about 10% in fixed income, about 15% in the hedge fund allocation. In the active long-term growth, because those are all traditionally oriented portfolios, we are 25% uh, target to fixed income. And then, as I mentioned, and that's the same as in the passive long-term growth strategy. And then with the income and growth, as I mentioned, it's 60% uh, fixed income, 40% uh, and longer term fixed income and 20% in short term. Within the, the two active long term pools, we are underweight our fixed income targets today. So if our target is 10, we have a target closer to eight. Uh, and we have a mix of both the fixed income LLC building blocks. So the, the, the core, uh, core plus uh, aggregate type exposure. And we also own allocations to sterling, which is shorter duration. So uh, in a quarter like the one we just experienced, having shorter duration in those funds was a bit of a negative because we measure that against the broader core market. But we do think that rates are still generational lows. We do think there's a potential for them to go up. Uh, and so having a small amount of low duration exposure within our fixed income just gives us a little bit more comfort that we'll have dry powder to be able to rebalance. And I think that's really the other notion as to why do we own fixed income. If equities sell off, and they will uh, eventually, uh, we don't know how and by how much, but uh, they will. And we want to have, we need to have something to rebalance from to be able to recommit to those positions. And uh, the, the small amount of fixed income allocation that we hold uh, gives us something to do there. So we we agree that we want to own less in general because it doesn't have a very high expected return. Uh, if the 10-year treasury yield today is at 1.18%, if rates don't move at all, that's the return you get. So that, that's, that's, a, that's a long way to our return targets from there, but we do need to still own something that gives us the ability to rebalance. And along the same lines as, as rebalancing, these are portfolios that also periodically have cash deeds. Um, distributions from the portfolio and it funds the community and it funds various organizations and and we don't want to be in a situation where we're selling at the bottom of an equity market similar to rebalancing um, you know we don't want to sell assets at a low point when when organizations need them the most okay thanks Tim. good point uh, our next question has there been a move to reduce the exposure to Chinese securities given what is being perceived as increased risk? Uh, great question. And I just read a couple of articles on that this morning. Uh, we're getting a lot of, a lot of good research on that. The short answer there is no. Uh, we haven't reduced uh, Chinese securities positions. Uh, we're of the interest to remain near market weight in Chinese securities. The recent activity has been painful for some, for sure. But the more time, the more research that we read and the more time we spend with the notions behind the Chinese regular regulators uh, reasonings for for making these moves, probably the most high profile move has been this after school tutoring 
uh, which uh, if you're if you're not a student of China, you might know you might not know anything about it. You might have only heard about it this last week or two as regulations have changed. But the, the there's some there's some good materials out there to read on views around this. And and really what the, the Chinese government is doing is they have if telegraph um, many of these views and their regulation is really about finding uh, at least some recent opinions I've read have, have suggested that they're trying to balance social equality with growth. And if you can find things to read on the on the after school tutoring, it's, it's an eye opening read and, and and their reasons for making regulatory changes there seem seem pretty reasonable, uh, or at least uh, from a from a human perspective. So I, I think as we think about working with our active managers that implement in China, and particularly as we consider China A shares, uh, which is the onshore market, being aware of how businesses will be perceived on the scale of growth versus social equality will be important going forward. It's a it's a different take on a risk factor, but it also doesn't suggest that every company in China, or even every fast-growing company in China, will be on the on the docket to receive, you know, more uh, the more draconian type outcomes like uh, like we've seen in that in the after-school tuition. Uh, uh, that that's a meaningful change in, in business profile for those companies. But for us, it just it just reinforces the importance of active management in in relation to Chinese securities. Uh, but it's still a very big market and a very big part of the future global growth uh, continuum. And so we have not we have not changed our view on Chinese security, or we haven't we haven't not reduced our exposure to Chinese securities. All right. Um, moving on to the next question, and actually we got two that are kind of on the same line here. Could you discuss your view on emerging markets and how that's changed, possibly given the impact of COVID? And the lack of vaccinations for their populations has the weighting of this in the portfolio changed as a result. And um, you know, I think the other question gets at you know the intentional overweight in emerging market that you had on, and are you reconsidering that? Yeah, great question. So uh, we are we are in those discussions currently to get a feel for. Uh, this balance between relative valuations and growth potential uh, with the impact and recovery coming out of COVID. Uh, we haven't finalized those thoughts but yet, but they should be coming along soon. And as we do that, then we, if there's a change in our view, then we would reflect that in the portfolios. We are modestly overweight emerging markets uh, versus our targets. The, uh, from a, on a near-term allocation basis, that's been a negative. Uh, are a modest negative, say, relative to, uh, let's say, holding U.S. stocks, but we're actually overweight emerging markets in many, in, in large part, by being underweight fixed income. So at, at, on, on the at the big picture level, uh, the positioning is actually added value. Uh, just depends on how you want to measure it. But we are, uh, we've talked a lot with our CIO and with our capital markets, global capital markets professionals. Uh, and there's been much discussion about this. We have not finalized our views yet, but I expect that that to come any time. And as we do that, then that will that will have some impact potentially on the weightings in the portfolio. We are, it's it's a good reminder that when we do make modest allocation overweights or underweights, we are again we're doing it at the margin. Uh, we want to add incremental return at a, an appropriate amount of incremental risk. And so if we do take these off, again, it's, it's about 2% overweight our targets. So if we're, at, we're a target of 10, we're, we're somewhere around 12 today. And if we decided to pull that back, we'd pull back to our long-term target allocation. Uh, in terms of the, in terms of the uh, you know, longer term global view and how that, how that emerging markets might impact uh, our view of emerging markets and then just this whole pandemic issue uh, might tender our view or temper our view around global investments. We still think we will operate in a global society. I think it's, this is primarily my personal view. I do think it's likely that you see uh, some increase in certain types of manufacturing coming back on shore. Uh, if you've seen recent governmental discussions, there's a lot of conversation about uh, subsidies for things like semiconductor manufacturing. 
So you could see some of that uh, onshoring happen uh, because there is a lot of question in the current administration around the um, uh, national security interests. And so you could see some uh, that I think from a human perspective and from the perspective of just being an American, it's probably a good thing. Uh, that won't be without impact. So it's, it's possible that uh, that could put pressure from an inflation perspective uh, to the extent that, that American wages might be higher than some other places. Uh, on the other hand, if you have to ship it less far, uh, perhaps you can, you can balance those out. I do think you could see some of that. We still do think though that growth opportunities outside the U.S. continue to be uh, meaningful. And we have not yet even really seen Europe come back to the full extent as we have seen in the U.S. and some other places. So we still like non-U.S. investments. We still do like emerging. As I mentioned, our, our intermediate term view might uh, is, is part of our conversation today. Uh, but we continue to believe that it's a global marketplace. Uh, we do think we could see some changes, but not so much that it would cause us to remarkably change where we sit, uh, at least based on what we know today. And I'll add that a big... Uh, factor in our allocation decisions is valuation. <clears throat> and when we look at valuations in emerging markets, they're much more attractive, they're much more cheaper than developed world, and particularly the US um, in light of recent performance. So that also factors into how we allocate capital over the intermediate term. Okay. Well, Travis, I think you answered this next one here, but I, I, I will ask it just to be sure, uh, you know, your comments around off onshoring, you know, um, are supply chain struggles and disruptions big enough to affect certain global investments? Yeah, I, I guess I did. I guess I did pre, I guess I did pre, pre answer that one a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think probably in certain sectors, but I think that the jury is still somewhat out on that. You know, it, even if uh, using my example of semiconductor manufacturing, for example, uh, even if the U.S. decided as a policy decision that more that semiconductors need to be made here, or a preponderance of semiconductors need to be made here, that's still a pretty long ramp period to get manufacturing up and running uh, to here. And so, while while there may be some impacts uh, to da Taiwan semi semiconductor, I know I read a story not too long ago that even even those building fabrication plants in the U.S. are sometimes non-U.S. companies. Uh, so I still think it's a, it's a global environment. I forget the name of the company, but I believe it was a Korean firm that was building a new fab plant in Arizona. And uh, I, I just think that the, we're global, and I think we're going to stay global, but I think at the margins, you could see some impacts as, as supply chain management changes. I, I suspect you could see some change in our, this had probably been, at least 40, if not 50 years of moving down this just-in-time management system, and which is in part why we're short of semiconductors. We, we, we've gotten away from holding big inventories. Uh, and so you could see some of that. All of these changes could be good for some things and bad for others. You know, holding excess inventory means you have get less turns on your working capital, which means you, only, you make less profit. Uh, and lower earnings could hit stock prices. So there's, there's just a lot of moving parts on this. Uh, we think the world will change. We think capital markets will adjust. Uh, and we think that will create new opportunities for potential growth. Uh, maybe that were different uh, in the last cycle. All right. Well, Tim and Travis, that concludes the, the questions that have been submitted. Um, as always, we thank you very much for being here today uh, and sharing your thoughts um, you know, with our donors. And, and thank you to all the participants. We, we obviously hope you found this uh, webinar informational. And uh, you know we are going to be posting this as soon as we can to our website. Um, you know, it, should you want to access it later. So that concludes uh, this quarter's webinar, and we hope you have a great uh, rest of your week. Thank you very much. <laughs>